what's the difference between a villain, an antagonist, a shadow archetype, and all the different gradations of bad guys in a story? The TLDR, the bottom line, we're going to get to it right here, right now, which is a villain has evil intent. An antagonist just opposes other characters. That is the bottom line. If you get nothing else from this video, if you turn it off right here, that is that is it. Now we're going to go in more depth. Now, another piece of this, if you wanted to go just another step further, is what about shadow archetypes and and what about shapeshifters and, and individuals who sometimes are antagonists to the protagonist or the hero? Those, though, the reason why these terms are confused is because there are two sets of terms from different families. Okay, you have um, terms like protagonist, antagonist, and hero that come from literary terms. They're, they're storytelling terms. And then you have terms like shadow and shapeshifter and hero, which actually come from psychological and mythological terminology. And so oftentimes these are paired or conflated or, mis or, or confused for the same thing because um, they perform very similar roles in a story and it's easy for people who don't have in-depth knowledge of storytelling to communicate with with those terms so again if you got nothing else out of that video out of this video that would be the the it now if you want to go further down the rabbit hole with me then let's get into it. Okay, first I want to talk about what precipitated this conversation, which is I did this video here a couple years ago called The Difference Between a Hero, Protagonist, and Main Character. And a, about two days ago, I had a, list, a viewer write this very detailed response, which was basically, in a nutshell, they were... They were saying, hey, I watched your video. This is, in my own words, a recap of what you said. In my, did I understand it right? And I would say some things they did and some things I noticed that there's still this misconception. And I also realized that by only focusing on the hero, the protagonist, and the main character, I forgot that there's a whole other side of the equation, which are the bad guys in the story, which are your villains, your antagonists, your shadows, that I did not discuss. And so if you have any questions about heroes, protagonists, and main characters, you should see this video. But if you wanna learn more about antagonists and villains and shadow characters, that's today's video. And bef the last thing I'll say before we go really in depth is some people wonder like, wh where does all this confusion come from? Why isn't, why isn't it very clear? It's because when you're teaching somebody a language, you're not teaching them about storytelling. So here in, in America, in the West, we learn English and we teach them the basics of storytelling. Often in elementary school and even high school, the main things we tell people are like there's a beginning, a middle, and an end to a story. There's rising action and climax, and and you have uh, you know they they may use terms like main character and hero and protagonist all together. They may very rarely you'll see them use things like shadow archetypes, but occasionally they'll pepper them in. And what happens is all these terms get conflated, and but that's okay. It's okay because they're learning it on a basic level. As you progress, if you are a storyteller, if you're someone who critiques stories, um, then you want to really understand the differences between these terms so that you know that the character is performing the role that you intended for them to, to portray. Uh, oftentimes too, if they're not performing the role that you intended for them to portray, understanding these differences will help you get the story back on track. So, with that out of the way, let's go and talk about some definitions now. The first definition we're going to look at 
is villain. According to Google, a villain is a character whose evil actions or motives are important to the plot. <coughs> the key thing here is evil actions or motives. As I mentioned in the earlier part of the video, that's the main defining thing of a villain. Whereas if we go over to the definition for antagonist, we see that Google says it is a person who actively opposes or is hostile to someone or something, an adversary. There's also two other definitions they don't apply to storytelling. And as a matter of fact, the definition that they give here in my opinion is a general definition if i was going to really narrow it down and niche it down to storytelling in particular i would say that an antagonist is a person who actively opposes or is hostile to someone or to or is hostile to a protagonist or the driving force of the story that's what i would say <coughs> so you can see that an antagonist can be hostile or oppose the protagonist, which usually, not always, but usually can be the hero, and yet not have evil actions or motives. So then the real question is, well, what makes an, act, an action or a motive evil? And hopefully what I'm about to explain here is going to clear things up. I have a lot of books behind me, probably thousands of dollars of books and courses that I've been through. By the way, I'm an English major. I've written many books. I've written books on storytelling. But as I've gone through all these year, all this years of research and stuff on my writing journey, one of the things that pops up again and again is this concept of evil when it comes to villains or shadow archetypes and things like that. And in order to understand it, it's like, well, what makes a character evil? And it boils down to two main things. It boils down to their intent and harm. So a character that is evil intends to do another character or person or group or entity harm. And so you have to ask, so then let's kind of break that down even more, okay? So um, if a character has intent to be hostile towards another character, but not harm them, then they're still an antagonist. And you might say, well, what is an example of that? I don't really, like, I don't get that. Like, that still doesn't make sense to me, Josh. Here's an example. A kid wants to eat a bowl of ice cream, a tub of ice cream. And the parent says no. They are intentionally telling the kid no. The kid is the driving force. The kid got the ice cream bucket, pulled it out, sat it, sat on the couch, started, started chomping away. The parent sees them and says, whoa, 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 whoa. Go put that back. There's no way you're eating all that. By the way, I, I may or may not be pulling from real life experiences. Uh, that parent is not a villain even though they have intent and they could even be a little hostile towards the, the, the child in, in getting them to stop eating it. Okay. Uh, uh, maybe another better example would be like a police officer stopping someone, maybe even like, uh, here's an even more ridiculous. I'm going to go beyond the police officer one. Let's say someone is crossing the street, an old grandmother or a little kid and then a car is coming their way, okay? And, and they don't know or they're, they're not fast enough. And somebody tackles them into the ground, okay? They, <clears throat> that person had intent on opposing them from reaching the other side of the road. But they did not have intent to harm them. Even if they did harm them. They did not have intent to harm them. They actually had intent to save them. Okay? So th that is an example of someone who has intent, maybe even harms someone, but doesn't have intent to harm someone. A doctor, you might even say too, right? A doctor gives a kid a shot that's going to protect them from 
I don't know, a, a cold or something. And yes, they inflicted pain, but it was in order to protect them from the cold, from the, the flu, the cold, the whatever. Then, then that doctor, of course, the kid went in and the parents knew that they were getting the shot. But the, that protects them from getting the worser version of the cold or whatever. Then that doctor did not have evil intent. Okay? They, they, maybe they inflicted the pain or whatever. Now, where this gets really hairy, though, <coughs> is when we talk about motives and um, crossing the line. And we'll, we'll discuss this in a minute here. Um, so, now, what if, somebody, uh, what if somebody does harm but doesn't have intent? So, before we talk about people who have intent, but they're not, like, they're not intending to do harm. They're intending to... So, for example, again, the, the person who dives... And, and protects the kid from, uh, from, from getting run over or something, right? That is that there's no intent. They have intent to stop the kid from getting what they want. And they even do harm them, but there was no intent to do harm, okay? Now let's talk about somebody who has intent, uh, who has no intent, but does harm. And this is like an accidental, like I didn't mean to, but I did it. Um, and I'll give you two examples. Example number one is a toddler who doesn't want to eat their food. And so they throw their fork at the parent character. That toddler had no intent on harming the parent. But when the fork hits the parent's arm or whatever, it, it let's say it injures them or it hurts them for a second. That toddler did inflict harm. On their parent even though it wasn't intentional they probably had no idea that that would actually hurt their parent that would be still not evil okay uh now uh, even more uh extreme example of this and th this is an example that like didn't happen to me in my life but i know somebody who it did is uh a kid or let's say two kids are playing um playing a game with toy guns and then one picks up a gun and shoots the other one and it was actually a live gun and it either kills the other kid or injures the other kid that kid had no intent on hurting the other kid but they did harm them and that again there's the, the maybe the kid maybe the kid that got shot dies or is injured really bad but the they didn't do it in per, on purpose they had no idea they they there was there was no evil behind that that especially when it's a kid not an adult who's just picking up a gun like most adults know if you pick up a gun like you have to be careful but a kid who's innocent to those things and and has no idea that's that's where there is no evil behind it so i know i spent a lot of time on this but it's uh sometimes the lines can get hairy especially when we talk about uh, some real life examples. So now let's let's go into some characters that we know. Here we have someone who who takes off all three boxes. This is a villain. This is a antagonist, and this is a shadow archetype. Sh Cersei Lannister. For those of you that are only listening, is who we're looking at. Cersei Lannister from Game of Thrones. And she is the shadow archetype to the tragic hero of Daenerys, Tardarian. <coughs> now, we're not going to go into super detail about these two, two characters. But what, what we can agree on is that most really good villains have one or two what we would call redeemable characteristics or mindsets. And... Um, Cersei's, without a doubt, is her love for her children. And even though Daenerys doesn't have any children, you could say her dragons are her children, and she definitely protects them. Um, Daenerys uh, would would agree and and find Cersei sympathetic in that sense, like that that one should protect their children. And in some ways, both by protecting her dragons and her people, Daenerys also 
has this mindset. But what happens is, and we're going to see kind of a reciprocal uh, thematic uh, structure here, is that Cersei, the, the difference with a villain is they'll take something that is a redeemable quality and they'll take it too far. Most villains' mottos are, you got to break a few eggs to make an omelet. And so Cersei's, uh, her redeemable characteristic is that she will protect her family. But here's the, here's the problem. The line that she crosses is at all costs. Meaning that she will protect her children even if it means that she has to kill other people's children. Or destroy a whole kingdom in, in the process. Or connive and take control and take, take intentional actions to harm other people. A.K.A. evil actions. That's what makes her a villain. Okay? Um, whereas what we often see with a tragic hero is that they have no intentional evil motives. They're trying to do what is good and the audience would agree that for the most part that's what they're doing. But what happens is they have what's called a fatal flaw. And that fatal flaw is something that that causes them to divulge into tragedy because they cannot give that fatal flaw away. And often the hero will share the same fatal flaw as the villain or the shadow figure. And so both of their fatal flaws is that, oh, is that when they don't get their way, they will kill people. And so Daenerys does it in the name of freeing, freeing her you know, the slaves and her pe all these people that are on the other uh, side of the, the, the water. And that's how she ends up get, amassing such a large army. Is she's always freeing people, which is, again, something we can all get behind and, and agree on. And she has no evil intent to, to hurt other people uh, intentionally. But what happens is then when she's confronted with an antagonist or a villain who won't allow her to achieve her goals or gets in her way, then the only way she can find control is by killing them. And we see this time and time again. And while I would agree with many people who criticize Game of Thrones that the final season uh, was rushed... And that we don't see her really divulge into madness as much as we probably should have. <coughs> like the Mad King, we always hear about the Mad King, her ancestor. What what we do have is a track record. If you go back and you rewatch all the seasons of Daenerys constantly uh, responsible for people's deaths when they wouldn't fall in line with what she wanted. And this is the fatal flaw that she shares with the Queen with Cersei and then and, and ultimately we see that both of them have tragic endings but that that is the difference here we have a tragic hero and and here here's the other thing too a tragic hero is someone who we met at the beginning of the story who was going in a positive arc and and not doing villainous behavior that falls into tragedy because of their fatal flaw it's not always villainous behavior but often it becomes that because of the fatal flaw, think of Romeo and Juliet have similar issues. A lot of uh, actually uh, Shakespearean tragedies do. But um, by the end, like by the end, when Jon Snow ends up taking her out, she has become a villain. A tragic hero, if you can watch my cursor here, they're, they're either going up or they're kind of going like this with their character arc. And then they descend into darkness. That descent is because of their fatal flaw. And once they descend, they have be basically become that which they did not want to be. Their enemy, their shadow. Their, the shadow represents their repressed feelings, emotions, desires. And so <clears throat> at the end of the day, what makes Daenerys so tragic is that she basically became pretty much like Cersei. Okay. Now, 
we got to keep moving here because this is already going to be a pretty long video. But um, you might ask yourself, okay, so if that's the case, what is an antagonist that's a shadow, but that's not a villain? And here you go. Professor Snape from the Harry Potter series. Professor Snape is the perfect quintessential example of a shadow antagonist who actually means to help Harry in some ways but often will oppose him and be an adversary and block him from things. But he's not there with evil intent. He's on the, the good guy's side. He's trying to, and, and, you know, he performs as a double agent at the, you know, in the, in the end films, we see that he basically dies. Um, he sacrifices himself to, to uh, save Harry. All these things that, if you're looking at it from a very basic level, you might say, oh, well, Snape, as a matter of fact, in some of the, like the first film, second film, and I would say even the third, in most of the films, he performs all of these actions that make Harry and the audience think he could be a bad guy. <coughs> but he's just an antagonist. And that is the difference. Snape is an adversary he's hostile towards harry and his friends he often blocks them from their goals or hinders them from achieving them but he has no evil intent or intent to harm harry or his friends and that is the biggest difference so snape snape is a great example of that he's also the shadow figure i mean yes you know, he dresses in, in black and stuff. It's, it's not about what a person dresses in. It's not something superficial like that. It's about what do they what do they show? He is the main professor for Slytherin and the uh, main professor for the dark arts. <coughs> and the reason why that's so important is because, again, because the shadow represents a person's repression, a hero's repression, their repressed emotions, desires, feelings. Um, the dark arts are what a bad wizard would want to do. And so a good wizard like Harry does not want to do those things. And so there's a lot he can learn from this professor. Um, is actually a very, like a great character to do entire studies on. But we have to keep moving. So now let's go into the next character, which I just wanted to show a different version of. Here we have the Joker from Dark Knight. Uh, I believe it's Dark... Oof. It's not Dark Knight, right? It's Dark Knight 2. Everybody knows which... Heath Ledger's Joker. And he is also a antagonist. He is a villain. And he is a shadow. Uh, actually, he is the, um, sorry, he's not the shadow. He is the trickster arch archetype. And so, um, or if anything, you would say he's the trickster blended with the shadow archetype. Okay. And what, what makes the difference between him being uh, the shadow versus the, the trickster? Two-Face. Okay. And I'm not saying it, it is, uh, uh, Two-Face isn't what makes him that. It's like we can see a clear difference, okay? And so let's talk about, uh, actually, let's go back to Two-Face for a second. Two-Face, on the other hand, is a tragic hero who becomes a villain and who becomes the shapeshifter, okay? So we, we already talked about the shadow figure with all the other characters we've gone over. Now what we're going to discuss is, again, the trickster with Joker and the shapeshifter with Two-Face, and the trickster, not always, but oftentimes, is like this puppet master. Uh, they, they're huge. They're, I don't want to say huge, but like in, in mythology and even modern films, you'll find they're very chaotic characters that are just trying to unleash chaos. Um, and even if they are what you might call a puppet master which is someone like, say, Emperor Palpatine or something, someone pulling the strings behind the curtains, um, they're, what they're really doing is inflicting uh, or unleashing chaos into the world. And 
the Joker is actually a really good example of this because even more so than the Emperor, like the Joker is less of a puppet master trickster and just a straight up trickster. And the the thing is though, he is the antithesis of Batman what Batman represents. Batman represents that basically society is worth saving and um, even though there were bad people that require vigilantism like Batman, that people and society is worth saving. Joker, on the other hand, has this nihilistic point of view, which is let the world burn. They're all going to eat each other. And we see that play out in this in the climax of the story. Um, Joker has evil intent, even though, again... He thinks, so with Joker, and in, with many iterations of the Joker, the Joker is fixated on Batman because Batman is the only person that has, uh, like, the psychosis that he can relate to or that, I guess, he obsesses with because he sees so much of himself in Batman. In some ways, Batman is the shadow figure to Joker. But, um, and Joker kind of wants to prove to Batman that 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 the world isn't worth saving and so even though there's all this madness going on with joker and he has his own reasons uh to believe this way the thing that is very consistent and logical about joker is that he's always trying to prove to batman like his point of view and so um but by doing so that's what you would say is like his redeemable characteristic is that he's trying to he's he's not just being evil with no no reasoning behind it he has a reason he believes that the world is is chaotic and that in in his eyes that's all he sees and what batman proves to him is that that isn't true and so um now, the way Joker goes about trying to prove this to Batman and the city and all of that is, again, by, by inflicting evil upon the world, doing harm intentionally to people. And uh, he's also an antagonist to Batman because all Batman is trying to do is to restore order to Gotham City. Now, on the flip side, oh, if we go to Two-Face which is the shapeshifter in the story. Uh, just a reminder here, shapeshifters, they are, from an archetypal standpoint, they're someone, they come in two flavors. They're someone that was either on the hero's side and then flips and is not on their side anymore, or they were seemingly against the hero and then back on the hero's side later, or, or not back on the hero's side, like, they were seemingly against the hero, and then the hero finds out later that they're actually on their side. Another great example of this is, again, Snape. I'm, I'm not going to go back to Snape for long, but he is a shadow and shapeshifter archetype. He is, again, wonderful character to do character studies on. Now, if we go to Two-Face, though, he is, the, he is basically like... Um, he is, I don't want to say the quintessential, but he is a, a poster child for a shapeshifter. He's, he's a less complex version than Snape is. And even he, though, is complex because some shapeshifters are just like they pretend to be on the hero's team and then they're not. Or, um, you know, they're, the, they're this dark knight that the hero meets uh, on the on the new lands they have a battle and then come to find out oh it's his uncle and they're actually on the same side that's usually a shapeshifter the interesting thing about two-face if i can indulge a little bit here is that he's a tragic hero in his own sense he he was this you know lawyer that was trying to fight the good and not i i wouldn't say had a naive idea about how you defeat um crime but he had this view that it's like kind of all or nothing and so when he lost his love and got disfigured 
it totally twisted his mindset. And of course, Joker had part to play in this. That's that is the part that makes Joker a bit of a puppet master. Is that he unleashed chaos basically through, uh, through this shapeshifter. And what we see is um, Two Face all of a sudden becomes evil. But there again, there is a method to his madness. Like we, the redeemable factor to Two Face is many of us have suffered a loss of a loved one, and understand what that is. Also, we can see by his disfigurement, like how terrible that might be for someone to uh, face that. And so um, there's there's like this redeemable factor that we understand why he thinks that way. But again. Most villains, a.k.a. people, characters who do evil things, they often cross the line from a, re from a relatable um, quality. So, yes, we all understand what it's like to lose someone, but that's no reason to then start killing people or allowing fate to decide by flipping a coin. That was that, That's one of uh, Two-Face's, like... Uh, <clears throat> I guess you could call it like a trope. But um, so there we have someone who is an antagonist, someone who is a shapeshifter, and someone who is a villain. And also tragic hero. So there we go. And now we're going to move along to the next. Okay. <clears throat> and I should have brought this up earlier. But going back straight up to antagonists. I think one of the best examples of a story where you have the the hero, which is also the protagonist, facing an antagonist that is not a villain would be Captain America Civil War, a.k.a. Avengers 2.5. <laughs> uh, in this movie, for those who haven't seen, the hero and the protagonist is Captain America. And he he basically ends up fighting one of the people on his team who is Iron Man, aka Tony Stark. And the interesting thing about this battle is that Tony Stark is not a villain. Tony Stark has no evil intent. He doesn't wish to harm anyone uh, or harm Captain America. He's actually only doing what he thinks is right and good. And to me, this is one of the best depictions of an antagonistic role because uh, th that, that plays out like as the main thing without a... I don't want to say without a villain, but like with the villain being so minor in this story. Uh, because now you have basically two heroes going against each other. Now, I'll talk about that in a second, but I do want to mention... There is a villain in the story. He, he is often overlooked by people who have seen this, especially if they're, they're not big into storytelling. But the villain is Baron Zemo. And I'm not going to go into detail, but essentially Baron Zemo, through various machinations, allows information about the hero's past to come to light, which pits the uh pits the avengers against each other and ultimately what happens is captain america has half of the avengers on his side and iron man has the other half of the avengers on his side and all of their motivations are realistic and true and the again the interesting thing is this is one of those things where uh one of those themes where <coughs> there's kind of this morally gray I don't even call it, want to call it morally gray, but like um, where people on the same side can disagree about an, an argument and, um, and it can divide them even though they all have good intentions. And so, you know, this happens on low levels between brothers and sisters and family members, parents, all the way up to the highest levels of our government. And this was a really great depiction i think 
And so let's talk about that, right? After the villain has set things in motion for the Avengers to pit against each other, the majority of the movie is basically the Avengers teaming up and fighting against each other until it culminates in this climactic battle between Captain America and Iron Man. And it's, it's the re, I guess you could, so an argument could be made that, well, Iron Man is physically fighting Captain America or vice versa. And he wants to basically kill the Winter Soldier. And in that sense, you could say, well, Iron Man has intent to do harm. <clears throat> but this is where it gets gray. Because Iron Man lost his family because of the Winter Soldier. We find out during the film that the Winter Soldier assassinated his family. And Iron Man knows that because the Winter Soldier can be programmed by uh, a series of codes or whatever that he could be um, compromised and pose a threat to other people and basically end up killing other people. And so Iron Man has both selfish and good motives at the same time. And what you could make an argument that his selfish motives are taking over and that he just wants revenge. But part of it is that, that he doesn't think that um, that the Winter Soldier should be allowed to live because he's a, he's concerned that someone else's family could suffer the same fate as as his. Additionally, there's this whole thing about Segovian Accords and whether or not heroes should be, um, you know, uh, held accountable for the destruction they cause and all this. And all the heroes like are split kind of 50-50 down the line on, on which side they're on. So the, those, are, those are the issues. Um, I would say that because Iron Man and Captain America are so evenly matched as superheroes that they're... It, that... Not that they're... Uh, yeah, that there is an evil intent. Like Iron Man... Is not trying to be a bad guy. He thinks he's doing what's right. And un I guess you could say. Unfortunately or fortunately. Captain America is just a little bit more in the right. On this one. And so that's what makes Iron Man. More of an antagonist than a villain. And not more than. He's just. He's an antagonist. And again. It's like. It's one of those things like. Is his intent. To do evil. Or, or harm. Yes. But is it like. A, it's one of those things where I think just like in the movie, the Avengers are divided. If you were to ask people like uh, if this was a real life scenario, it would be 50 50. And the reason why we know this is because like there are so many controversies when it comes to, um, you know, police being caught in the middle of um and I guess police aren't the only ones, but police and other public figures being caught in the middle of, you know, uh, someone's death or some like misuse of um, police authority and things like that. And so as we've seen in our own country, um, you know, people can be quite divided. And this is aptly named Civil War because people on the same team go to war with each other. Anyways, the point of bringing this up though is this is a great example of someone who's an antagonist who's not a villain fighting against the protagonist who is the hero. <coughs> I would say that um, Tony also serves... Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I, won't go, I won't go that far. I think Baron Zemo is still the... Uh, he's the trickster. Tony, Tony might be the shadow in this regard from an archetypal standpoint because uh, it's kind of like repressed desires and emotions. Because you got to remember, too, that before they get to the final climax, both of them, their thought process was that they were going to um, stop and kill the other winter soldiers 
and then they find out that um, they're already dead. So there was a part of Captain America that shared that kind of fatal flaw that Tony had. Okay, so again, moving along, I know this is taking a long time. I'm trying to give you everybody like a, a good example. Okay, now you might ask yourself, well, what about can a villain ever be a main character? Surely they can't because if you're a main character, that means you're a good guy. <coughs> and that is incorrect. That is wrong. Villains can definitely be main characters and even the quote-unquote protagonist of a story. And I would say even a villain can be the hero of the story. And that is crazy, but it is true. Now, these are... I'm not saying there aren't any stories like this. And I, I can tell you, like, I only thought of a couple off my head. If I dug in real deep i can probably find more but these are the ones that that pop out right at me uh if you want to dig into this primal fear <coughs> for those of you that aren't familiar with primal fear it basically follows this kid who's played by edward norton that has been accused of murdering a priest actually it has it right here and um Oh, God, why can't I think of this actor's name? Anyways, a lawyer comes to basically represent him. And what we find out in the end is that the kid was tricking the lawyer the whole time, that guy, Edward Norton, and was actually lying and did kill the priest at, in, in cold-blooded murder. And... <clears throat> the the point of the now an argument could be made that richard greer who is the lawyer is the main character of this story i i concede that that is true but this is a story where you some people might see that the boy is the main character and richard greer is maybe just the protagonist and what you what you will see is that um in the end spoilers i mean this is a movie from the 90s so everybody should have seen it by now uh, the boy is guilty and the boy was the villain the whole time. The boy was basically a, a, a trickster the whole time. The boy was, um, the boy was not the antagonist though. The antagonists are all the people who are trying to prevent the lawyer and the boy from winning the case. And so that's where it's a little different. Okay, now let's go to another one where they're, where uh, the character is definitely the both the protagonist and the hero and all these other things. And that is a recent show called Where the Crawdads Sing. <coughs> this is about basically this girl right here who is accused of murdering this boy right here um, in this small town. She basically lives in the swamps and... And the small town people don't really like her. And they've always treated her poorly and all this other stuff. She, she grew up in a bad life. And what you find out in the end of the story is that basically uh, it's very similar to the first one, Primal Fear, where there's a whole trial set up. And the story is kind of played in fat flashbacks that show you like what led up to the murder. But at the end of the day, there's there's a trial and the girl is found not guilty. The, and the, the reasoning is there. What they say is that, um, the girl, everybody picks on the girl because she's from the outer bank or not the outer banks, but like she's, she grew up in the swamp and everybody picks on her. And just because the town doesn't know her, that's why they're accusing her of the murder when there isn't enough evidence to prove that it's her and so she gets off and then the, basically the prologue you see like her and her husband grow old together and everything and then then later they basically find out the whole time she had lied she had lied to the townsfolk she had lied to her husband she had in cold blood murdered the guy now she had reasons <coughs> the guy was abusive to her no doubt. 
But again, that's like that's one of those like redeemable characteristics for a villain where where you feel bad for the villain and you can relate with the villain, but the villain took it too far. They she took someone else's life when she didn't have to. And and also like more so when you talk about like um where was the intent to do harm? Cuz a case could be made like okay, if the dude was abusing her and plan on doing it again, that that uh that's self-defense okay fair enough well the story doesn't depict it like that but let's say that that was the case then the next part of it is that um uh there's this ad thing so i'm gonna scroll down but the next part of that argument is she still lied to her husband and the townspeople in order to basically keep this secret which was evil so um they again there you have uh a villain and again a very likable villain to to be fair that uh gets away with murder and then lastly memento another good story um where the you the main character has a short-term memory loss about his wife's murder and what you end up finding out is that like he was basically part of it and he like his memory loss makes him forget that he's actually the villain of his own story and so it's pretty clever i love this film but <coughs> yet another story where the villain is also his own and there are other antagonists but in a lot of ways he's his own antagonist because of his memory loss and stuff like that so uh, Memento, great example. I would recommend all three of these films if you are planning on writing a villain as the hero or main character of your story. All right, what else do we have here? Oh, yeah, American Psycho. Another one where we have uh, a villain who is the main character of the story and also uh, the hero, etc., etc. So I'm not going to belabor this point. These are examples. The, the, the whole reason I'm bringing these up is to show to everyone that the hero can be a villain, meaning that they can have evil intent. Now, some of you might be asking, what is the difference between a hero, or sorry, a villainous hero and a anti-hero? Because those are often mixed up. And the bottom line is this, is that an anti-hero is just somebody who doesn't play by society rules. Wolverine is a pretty good example of this. That does not make them evil. Just because you don't conform to society rules or, or you're kind of an outcast. Batman, probably another example of an anti-hero. Someone who uh, doesn't really conform to the the uh the the cultural standards that that one would expect doesn't make him a villain because he does not have evil intent he's not trying to harm other people or society okay and then lastly we'll talk again a little bit more about the tragic hero with anakin <coughs> Here we see the infamous scene where Anakin chops off Mace Windu's arm, helps Emperor Palpatine, and then ultimately succumbs to his fatal flaw and turns to the dark side, becomes Darth Vader. At this moment, Anakin goes from hero to tragic hero and basically transitions into villain. Because from this point forward, and we, we see in this film, he does evil acts. He basically from this point forward puts an end to the Jedi order by inflicting intentional harm on them. You, one could say that this moment right here, uh, was, uh, you know, what's the word impulsive, but it was still intentional. He'd been, he had, Anakin had, they, they showed maybe not well, but they did show, that Anakin had um, resentments against the Jedi Order that Palpatine only fostered over time. 
which leads Anakin to perform this villainous act. And then later on, we see Anakin become a redemptive hero in the sense that um, he was a tragic hero that turned to a villain, but by destroying or defeating Emperor Palpatine, he basically redeems himself and turns back to the good side. And so there you have a redemptive hero. And then as a side note, Darth Vader is, of course, a shadow archetype for Luke Skywalker. Emperor Palpatine is more of a trickster puppeteer type of archetype. And we could go on and on. But this video is pretty long. We've covered a lot. I believe it's almost an hour. I will break this up into smaller pieces. But uh, hopefully that has helped. Hopefully you all have a better understanding now. The differences between a villain and an antagonist. And an anti-hero. And a tragic hero. And a redemptive hero. And all the different things in between. And what makes a, someone evil versus not evil. And can a... Can a uh, villain be a hero and things of that nature? So there you go. And if you have any questions, drop them down below. If you liked, like, comment, share, subscribe. Take it easy.